Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight is CBC News exclusive. Former Governor General Julie Payette may be removed from the Order of Canada. If it happens, it will be absolutely unprecedented. The push to make it happen and the reasons not to. And this is an excessive uh, approach. Ready to line up for a third COVID-19 vaccine shot? They're doing it elsewhere. Why Canada might not. I'm Adrian Arsenault in Tokyo. Swimmer Penny Alexiak tries to make history tonight to become the most decorated Canadian Olympian ever. Grace, athleticism, and immense mental pressure. Every athlete has to make a decision for what's best for them. Simone Biles' candid talk about mental health has started a wider conversation, a close look at what elite athletes are facing. This is The National. For the first time, a former governor general faces having one of this country's highest honours revoked. A panel now considering whether to remove Julie Payette from the Order of Canada. It's for the same issue that Payette in January became the first governor general to resign that post amid controversy, her alleged mistreatment of her staff. Payette was first honoured for her achievements as an astronaut and then for her appointment to that important but mostly ceremonial office. Ashley Burke broke a number of stories during Payette's fall from grace, and tonight she speaks exclusively to the BC man whose official complaint launched the review. As Governor General, Julie Payette presented one of the country's most prestigious honours to hundreds of Canadians. Now an advisory council is considering taking away her own Order of Canada. Never has a governor general uh, been stripped of an honour. Uh, just as simple as that. Only seven Canadians in history have ever been stripped of the honour. None for harassment. Julie Payette's recent actions have tarnished that honour. Vancouver welder Giovanni Cormano filed this complaint to Rideau Hall after Payette's resignation six months ago. He argues her pattern of alleged mistreatment against staff at Rideau Hall, the Montreal Science Centre and the Canadian Olympic Committee tarnishes the Order of Canada's reputation. There's so many people um, that hold the honour of Canada, like Tommy Douglas and Terry Fox, and to group all those people with Julie Payette, I think, is unfair. According to the rules, an Order of Canada can be revoked for criminal charges, or if there's conduct that is a significant departure from the standard of behaviour expected from members of society. But some constitutional experts argue that to consider revoking Payette's honours goes too far. She wasn't dismissed. Um, any allegations that were leveled uh, have not been proven in any uh, court of law. Therefore, to my mind, this is an excessive uh, approach. Undeniably, she's paid a high price. Her reputation has really suffered. And I don't think we need to take the next step of being vindictive, of, of pursuing every possible way in which we can um, uh, punish her for her conduct. Payette was originally appointed to the Order of Canada for making history in space, the first Canadian to visit and help assemble the International Space Station. Some believe that's an honour still worth recognising. Ashley, what do we know about Julie Payette's uh, reaction? She's declined to comment, but a spokesperson on her behalf said in a statement to CBC News that she's focusing on her own personal issues right now and that she doesn't want the public's attention to be taken off the newly appointed Governor General, Mary Simon. And speaking of Mary Simon, if this advisory panel does recommend stripping Payette of the honour, that final decision would go to the current Governor-General. Exactly, and she's not a stranger to this process. She sat on an advisory council in 2014 that recommended to strip the Order of Canada from former media baron and convicted fraudster Conrad Black. Ian? All right, Ashley, thank you. Thank you. Sixteen years ago, the Roman Catholic Church agreed to pay tens of millions of dollars to residential school survivors. Now, CBC News has obtained documents showing much of that was spent on lawyers, loans and administration. Jason Warwick walks us through it. We try to support our survivors the best way we can. Melissa Parkin works at Saskatoon's Indian and Métis Friendship Centre, helping residential school survivors and their descendants to heal. She is the granddaughter of a survivor herself, and today she is angry. A CBC News investigation has revealed that money the Catholic Church was supposed to give to programs to help survivors went to lawyers and administrative expenses instead. I feel like they're not being responsible for 
uh, these survivors, like these survivors feel like they don't, they're not um, respected and listened to. As part of the 2005 Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, the Catholic Church agreed to three things. That it would try to fundraise $25 million for survivors, provide them with $25 million worth of in-kind services, and make a $29 million cash payment to programs for survivors. Church officials have repeatedly said that they kept that last promise, but new details in documents obtained by CBC News show some of that money being spent on other things. $2.7 million for lawyers for unrelated work, $2.3 million allocated for administrative costs, $1.8 million loaned to the fundraising campaign, and $8.4 million deducted for amounts paid to survivors before this agreement. First Nations leaders hope an investigation will now be launched. Obviously, uh, you know, we hope that there is uh, some type of investigation and right, right away, uh, do it now. Like, don't wait six months and uh, trying to find every excuse in a book to delay or prolong an investigation. Today, Federal Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations said there is no excuse for the actions of the Catholic Church and that it, quote, has a moral responsibility to support healing and closure in response to the role they played in this tragedy. In an email, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops said they're committed to listening and engaging, but said they were not part of the corporation that oversaw the settlement deal. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Saskatoon. In Manitoba, a Catholic priest has been banned from preaching and teaching publicly after accusing residential school survivors of lying about the abuse they faced. The statements were made at a Winnipeg church over weeks of services which were streamed online. Fill-in priest Father Real Foré told parishioners that survivors lied about sexual abuse to get more money from settlements and joked about shooting protesters who defaced churches. The Archdiocese has issued an apology disavowing the comments completely. Veterans of the war in Afghanistan say Canada isn't doing enough to get their former Afghan colleagues out of that country and away from the Taliban. After wrongly saying yesterday they had just three days to apply for help, today the federal government is vowing to move quickly. Evan Dyer explains. I can ask you again, who are the ones who did this? They literally saved our lives time and time again, and they've given up their lives. Dustin Seabrook served two tours with the infantry in Kandahar. He says Afghans who worked with his unit were comrades who also became friends. After yesterday's confusion over forms and deadlines, the government today says it's focused on saving its former allies. People who have worked for Canada, who therefore absolutely have the right to come to Canada, should be getting on those planes as quickly as possible. Not quickly enough, right. says Seabrook. I mean, the U.S. has increased their um, their their, their uh, you know their gain or whatever to get as many interpreters over as they can, but Canada's done nothing. As you know, uh, earlier this month. Uh, President Biden announced... Uh, Indeed, as district after district falls to the Taliban, the Biden administration has ramped up its efforts to meet the demands of U.S. veterans who want their former Afghan comrades saved. Tonight, 750 interpreters and family members will land on U.S. soil in Fort Lee, Virginia. The administration is taking uh, whole groups of people, whole plane loads of folks who otherwise would have to wait in Afghanistan uh, for their visas to process. Former Canadian Army Captain Corey Shelson wants to know why that can't happen here. We should be putting a plane on the tarmac in Kabul and we should be moving these people to Trenton and then dealing with the paperwork. Job one, though, is to clear up the confusion and fear that the government caused yesterday with its 72-hour deadline. Officials said they would reach out to interpreters to tell them there is no deadline. But today, CBC News spoke to two who'd received that ultimatum and say they still haven't received any correction. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Oh, you see that flame burning and you know what's next? Our coverage of the Olympic Games, Tokyo 2020. Day seven of competition, action begins in the water, and Penny Alexiak is on the hunt for more medals after her historic 200-meter freestyle bronze. It's really weird, but I mean, I'm not done yet, so I hope that there's more coming. 
And Moore isn't just about one medal. She is already tied for Canada's most decorated Olympian. Four in Rio 2016, two so far in Tokyo. If she wins ten one tonight in the 100-meter freestyle, she breaks that record, most Olympic medals in Canadian history. So a lot at stake at the Tokyo Aquatic Centre, and that's where Adrian is right now. Adrian. Hey, hi there, Ian. You know, just listening to you, regardless, clearly, of what happens here in the pool, Penny Alexiak obviously has astonished everyone. You know, this is a sport where it is possible to win a lot of medals, but as we all keep saying, no summer Olympian has ever won as many in any sport as Penny Alexiak. This event really means something to her. The 100-meter freestyle is where she won her gold in Rio. Now, this particular pool of swimmers is really strong, so nothing is a lot. But as she always says, don't ever count her out. And depending on how things go in the coming hour, what's next? Well, it's possible we'll see her in the pool again. On paper, she is due to do the 4 by 100 meter medley relay. Uh, that's a decision that will be made depending on how much gas there is in the tank. But really, this is a moment in the games where attention shifts from the pool. Things start winding down here to the track. Now, the track is where uh, Canada's men won the bulk of their medals, uh, medals in Rio. So the storyline will shift a little bit, the attention will shift a little bit as we head into a different phase. But for now, the pool is clearly the place to be. And that's where we'll talk to you next hour. Thanks, Adrian. You bet. The Tokyo Olympics have been different from past games in some very obvious ways, but one thing no one expected was how much of the discussion would focus on mental health. And that is thanks to athletes like Simone Biles. Briar Stewart shows us why, for many, this conversation is long overdue. When it comes to gymnastics, there's no bigger stage than the Olympics. The world media, particularly the U.S. broadcasters, focus on every triumph and slip. And in Tokyo, the event is unfolding without the sport's biggest star. Simone Biles withdrew to focus on her mental health, a decision both competitors and teammates applauded. As much as like this is a big event, it's so important to take care of your mental and like phys physical body. Even before the Olympics, Biles had talked about suffering from depression and the struggle that comes with always being expected to win. But her decision here in Tokyo is part of a larger conversation around the pressure to perform and the impact it can have on mental health. After Naomi Osaka lost in an upset earlier this week, she spoke about how tough it was being in the spotlight. Canadians look like they got third. Today, after Kaylee Filmer and Hillary Jansen's road to a bronze medal in women's pairs, Filmer spoke about her own experience with depression. I wouldn't be here without Hillary and everyone that I have back home, and I hope that everyone just knows that, like, keep the people around you tight and they're going to support you and you can get through it. In 2019, researchers at the University of Toronto surveyed Canadian athletes training for the Olympics. The recently published study found that as many as 40% were likely dealing with mental disorders such as depression or anxiety. We've seen uh, an increase in, in athletes um, reaching out and, and saying it's a topic that, that we should be discussing. In Tokyo, IOC officials say there's a 24-hour hotline where athletes can access free counselling. Rosie McLennan has already won two gold medals and is competing again in these games. She says she tries not to focus too much on winning. Every athlete has to make a decision for what's best for them. Uh, I think it was incredibly courageous of Simone to put her mental health first and um, I commend her for that. For someone who has elevated the entire sport of gymnastics, Biles decision and influence has the power to change just how athletes speak about and deal with mental health. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Tokyo. And later in the hour, we'll hear from a mental performance coach who's working with Canadian athletes in Tokyo. And he'll tell us about the impact Simone Biles is having and the advice he's giving athletes ahead of their competitions. But now let's move to a disturbing story out of Quebec, a suspicious death that went unnoticed for days because first responders mistook the body for a burned-up mannequin. Sarah Levitt tells us what happened and looks at how a mistake like that could be made. 
Signs of the fire are still fresh at the edge of a wooded area six days later. Written on one of the cards, to my sister, I will never forget you. A woman is dead, but for almost an entire day, police believed her body was a mannequin that had been set on fire. Sherbrooke's police chief Danny McConnell is giving few details on what happened. Workers on break at this factory called 911 saying they saw someone set fire to a mannequin. Police say when they arrived, the fire was out and all that remained was what they took to be the burnt mannequin. Le mannequin sera dans le he says they threw it out in this dumpster next to the police station. Four hours later, he says, a man called to report his wife missing. Tracking her cell phone, police discovered her car down the street from the fire. That's when police made the connection and removed the remains from the dumpster. You know the general outline of a human body. Uh, but without a close look, it's very difficult to separate it from a, a very well done burnt mannequin. It's, it's not unreasonable in certain situations. Now, there's other situations where it would be ludicrous to, to, to misinterpret. The death is considered suspicious and is under investigation. There's another investigation into the police error. Behind all this is a family in mourning. Nous sommes évidemment désolés. To whom Sherbrooke police offer their apologies. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. With most countries still talking about first and second shots, Israel has become the first to start rolling out third doses of COVID-19 vaccine. Should Canada follow suit? And our bigger issue is we just don't have enough Canadians or enough people around the world vaccinated, um, you know, with two doses of protection. Up next, the back and forth on booster shots. Plus, Tokyo 2020 is about far more than medals. The moment I crossed the start line, Yesterday, we made history. History. How fighting for rights and breaking down barriers is a family affair for some, and... They are a foreign invader the same way that a bacterium or a virus would be a foreign invader. With hundreds of recent smoke warnings across the country, what's the real impact of hazy skies? We're back in two. Those who wait for Penny Alexiak's 100-meter freestyle race, an Olympic win for Canada's women's eight rowing team. They took an aggressive lead early in their race and held on for gold, and this is Canada's first gold medal in that event since 1992. 
Heavy monsoon rains have triggered major flooding and landslides in southern Bangladesh. At least six deaths have been reported in the region, which houses some one million Rohingya Muslims in one of the world's largest refugee settlements. Officials say heavy rains are expected to continue for the next few days. Stay home. One month, two months, one year, no problem. Some optimism from some residents of Australia's largest city as officials in Sydney seek military assistance to help enforce COVID lockdown orders. Restrictions were extended for at least another month for some 6 million people after the city saw a record one-day rise in local cases fueled by an outbreak of the Delta variant. Now to COVID here, Ontario has met one of its key conditions for the next phase of its reopening. More than 80% of those 12 years old and up have had one dose of the COVID vaccine. Another condition has to be met first. 75% of those same people have to have a second dose. The province is talking about loosening the third condition that all public health units need to have at least 70% uh, fully vaccinated. If that happens, most restrictions can be lifted by August the 6th. Newfoundland and Labrador is expected to announce tomorrow it's dropping its mandatory mask requirements as of this coming Tuesday. But the chief medical officer, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, says they won't be following Alberta's lead by lifting nearly all restrictions. Not until more people in the province get vaccinated. Israel lifted many of its restrictions in June after many of its adults were fully vaccinated. But an outbreak of the Delta variant has the country ready to deliver a booster shot. Experts in Canada aren't so sure we need to follow suit, though. Here's Vicodopia. To protect the freedoms Israelis enjoy, officials are launching a second round of booster shots. If the experts in the government have decided that that's what has to be done, then uh, I'll be first in line to be vaccinated for the third time. I made the last one, the second one, in January, and I hope to do it uh, next week. Israel was quick to get its population the vaccine, but its vaccination rate remains lower than Canada's, and yet the country opened up sooner. And surprise, surprise, Delta variant arrived, and Delta variant is very contagious, easily spread, and was brought into the country, and it's going berserk. Indeed, Israel's infection rate is now 10 times Canada's, mostly in the unvaccinated. But Israeli authorities say vaccinated people are also getting infected, though not as severely. One explanation? Experts point out Israelis got their two shots closer together, which is not as protective as waiting longer. Canadian researchers say for most older people here, two doses are enough for now. Their immune profile seems pretty strong, as strong as we would expect. Um, and we, there's no evidence that boosting it would, would markedly change things. Pfizer is developing a new version of its vaccine for the Delta variant, but it's not ready yet. It sounds like what Pfizer is selling, you know, the people of Israel, the, the, those who are 60 and older, is just the third shot of the same thing. And, and our bigger issue is we just don't have enough Canadians or enough people around the world vaccinated, um, you know, with two doses of protection. Israel has already given a second round of booster shots to more than 2,000 immunocompromised people. The UK wants to do the same in September. In Canada, health officials have yet to announce their plans. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Never mind boosters, there is a push in the United States to just get people vaccinated in both the public and private sectors. Judy Trin shows us the plan. This is American tragedy. Americans have an abundance of COVID vaccines, but not enough takers. So President Biden is forcing 4 million federal workers to prove they've been vaccinated or get tested at least once a week. People are dying and will die who don't have to die. The mandate comes one day after health officials recommended a return to indoor masking, rankling some Republicans. The CDC has become a political arm of the administration. It wants to control every element of our life. Despite opposition, corporate America appears to be coming on side. Media giants Facebook, Google and Netflix are requiring employees to get vaccinated before they return to the office. And today, a major restaurant chain announced that customers will have to show proof they rolled up their sleeves if they want to eat inside. 
I think that none of us wants to turn back and experience what we experienced in, in 2020 and even in early parts of 2021. Our industry was prohibited from having any type of revenue uh, in terms of indoor dining for most of last year. But some see this as a limit on freedom. Individual people should not have to give any medical records of any kind unless it, unless they choose to do so. It should not be required. You know what I believe? I believe God works. I don't know about the vaccine, though. Vaccine hesitancy is driving up cases. Nearly 85,000 new infections recorded yesterday, adding pressure on hospitals. We've got a huge spike in COVID in our ER and it's taking up beds from other patients. Remember, heart attacks still happen, strokes still happen, gunshots still happen. More than 600,000 Americans have died from COVID. If mandates don't work, the president is hoping money will. He's urging states to use federal funds to pay people to get vaccinated. Judy Trin, CBC News, Washington. When U.S. gymnast Simone Biles withdrew from competition this week, she sparked an important conversation about the intense mental pressures faced by Olympians. Up next, my conversation with a Canadian coach who's worked with some of this country's top athletes on their mental game. Welcome back. The Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games have been unusual and challenging from the start. And maybe this has added to the pressures on athletes, or maybe they're just more willing to speak publicly about it. Led by Olympic champion gymnast Simone Biles. I was just like shaking, could barely nap. I've just never felt like this going into a competition before. Once I came out here, I was like, no, mental is not there. Biles is just the latest athlete to talk about mental health on the world stage. Tennis star Naomi Osaka also recently shared her personal struggles, and it's a conversation Jean-Francois Menard has had with the athletes that he trains. As a mental performance coach, he's worked with Canadian Olympians past and present, including athletes currently competing in Tokyo. He's also the author of this book, Train Your Brain Like an Olympian. And Jean-Francois Menard joins us now from Montreal. Hi. Hello, Ian. Let's start with Simone Biles. How significant is it for someone at her level to come out and say what she did in Tokyo? 
Well, this is huge. I mean, and and I think it's, um, you know, obviously my heart goes out to Simone and it's never fun to see that happen with an athlete. But at the same time, it just demonstrates that athletes are human beings. You know, they're not robots and they're not immune to this. And if you think of their actual profession, and I mean, you know, there's very few people that go through so much emotional, psychological and physical struggles as they do. They're constantly pushing the limits. And at some point, uh, you know, we got to respect that. And, you know, I'm frustrated when I hear people saying that Simone is weak, you know, she's not able to handle the pressure. I think it's the complete opposite. I think it takes a tremendous amount of mental strength and courage to come out, especially on a big stage like this and, and talk about this. So um, hopefully this is going to encourage other people to speak out and to get some resources uh, to deal with their mental struggles. But, but help me understand this, because I, I find this fascinating because on the... Uh, you, Part of your job and the athlete's job is to push through the level of anxiety and doubt that would make a lot of us just, just give up. So, so how do you do that without pushing them too far? Well, I think, you know, the important thing is to have a great support system around you and to have coaches that you can really trust and you can communicate openly with them. Uh, because in the end, a lot of these athletes, the, I mean, they go through trainings that have put that have been put together by, you know, their sport coaches or their physical coaches. And um, you need to provide feedback because at some point going too far, it becomes dangerous. And speaking out about it, being very transparent, I think is the best way to avoid this. Um, and in the end, it allows you to be healthy and also have fun in your sport. Because I mean, that's why we do this. It's it's not it's not to be sick. It's not to be injured all the time. It's actually to enjoy yourselves um, and and you know really truly uh, have fun. So yeah. uh, for me, it's it's authentic communication and very being transparent. Let's talk about these Olympics. And as I mentioned, you have some athletes you're working with who are in Tokyo right now. What impact has the pandemic had? I mean, in terms of training, in terms of delaying the Olympics by a year, uh, how has that affected the athletes? It had a huge effect, Ian. I mean, dealing with uncertainties for 18 months is not easy. I mean, these, these athletes are creatures of habits and they're always accustomed to having a very clear plan and getting ready for something that's coming up. And Theoretically speaking, we didn't know if these games were going to happen until about a month ago. And so to stay motivated and focused uh, within an environment where you're unsure and what's going to happen, that's that's not, it's not easy for athletes. It's not easy for anyone. And I kept telling the athletes, you know, the best way to manage uncertainties is by focusing on the certainties. So we always came back about what they needed to do on the day of maybe the next few days, maybe the next week. But to let go of what's going to happen in three weeks or three months, because that we can't control for someone who's watching, whether they are an elite athlete or they are a student, uh, you know, dealing with a, a anxiety filled time at, at school, what do you hope the lesson is for them from Simone Biles? Well, the lesson is that our, our, our brain is the motor to performance. And regardless if you're a student or a news anchor or, you know, uh, you know a lawyer, it doesn't matter what you do. We, we all deal with pressure, expectations and stress and, and nervousness. And uh, we got to respect that. And, you know, I, I think mental toughness is not it's not a bonus. It's not something we should just potentially add to uh, to our daily regimen. I think it's a necessity. And in the end, you, you can't really tap into your full potential if you can't self-manage yourself. And so, you know, if simple skills like mindful breathing to be able to calm down on demand uh, or have techniques to boost your self-confidence at, at particular moments so that you, you know, you, you're convinced that you can do something well uh, or be able to put your focus on the right thing at the right time. I mean, this is not only for important for, for athletes, but it's important for everyone. You have some great insights. Really nice talking to you. Thank you for having me. It was a heartbreaker for Canada, but for a tiny island nation, it meant so much more. Coming up, why Fiji isn't taking anything about these Olympics for granted. Plus... I'm just so happy that the team I'm working with just accepted me as, as who I am. Up next, a Canadian family that is breaking down barriers and supporting each other while they do it.
którzy dzisiaj wstali i idzie, są z nami. I dziewczyną. Polish rower Katarzyna Zielman thanking her girlfriend following her team's silver win. Zielman later told reporters she wants to use her platform to speak out for LGBTQ rights. Poland is ranked as the worst country in the European Union for LGBTQ people, according to an EU-funded advocacy group. Olympic organizers have touted these games as the most gender-balanced in history, but diversity and inclusion at the games haven't always come easy. It has taken advocacy to get there, and people like Haley and Kimberly Daniels. Adrian Arsenault has their all-Canadian story. Gold medalist and Olympic champion. Let's talk about first, and not podium first, as glorious as they are. There's more happening here than that. Bottom and she's missed the gate. This first is about a Canadian athlete who didn't get near a medal or even the finals in canoe slalom. But it will not be better than a 21st place finish. Haley Daniels, gracious in that moment, maybe because she knows this is bigger than one performance. And we're underway with racing. This was the sports Olympic debut. And like a lot of Olympic events, excluding women was just a tainted tradition. It's changing. To take the race lead. Haley is part of bringing it here, which is part of why when CBC first met up with her in the village, she was so emotional. It's a really big deal for me to be here. Um, I get chills talking about it. It's, it's just, we're here, I'm so excited. There's more to that heart. It's a lot about the story of her dad, who she still calls dad. Kimberly Daniels, the first transgender judge at the Olympics. She raced without fear in the heats yesterday. Canoe slalom is also her sport. And just before judging the medal round, they shared a few moments with us. The moment I crossed the start line yesterday, we made history, history. <laughs> And uh, I, I'm just so proud to be part of the first wave of female canoeists to ever be in the games and have my dad by my side. We met Haley the other day. She says incredible things about you. And as much as this is about her Olympic journey, it's about yours too. I guess so. Uh, <laughs> I'm here. I just happened to, uh, I made a couple changes, but I'm still here. Uh, and I'm just so happy that the team I'm working with just accepted me as, as who I am. Do you feel that, that everything is as you hoped it would be? Oh, it's been better, better. I was honestly concerned about going through immigration. And, and I had the best experience ever, ever. It was, it was so positive. And that just makes me feel included. To be first is a responsibility. Kimberly's been fielding calls from athletes nervous about coming out. Haley has found herself offering support too. She posted the CBC story the other day and tucked into the comments a message from the mother of Chelsea Wolf saying it would be awesome if she could meet Haley. Chelsea is an American transgender BMX rider. She's an alternate on the team and just yesterday she connected with Haley in the village. She was tearing up a little bit, I think, um, when I was telling her how proud I was of her and how amazing what she is doing. I think that just it's important for me for her to hear it. I've had a, so many messages um, in the last couple weeks, and they said that the thing that they find really hard is that there's so much focus on the person that's transitioning and not focus on the people who are going through the transition as well. And I think that. That's something that we've been working on as a family. My mom um, and my brother and my aunties and uncles and my, my grandparents, it, it's all of us are going through it and we all are dealing with it in different ways. And we need to be respectful of that. And, and um, I think we've done a really good job. And I understand, support the family in that community that's supporting that person. Because that's what creates that safe environment. Right. That's why it's so important that Haley's beside oh, you, right? Totally. Could you imagine this without this warrior here? I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Honestly, I wouldn't have. It was I'm too important. I'm you right now. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> That's I doing know. it to me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so there wasn't much time to talk. Haley had to get on a plane to Canada. Kimberly had to go back to judging. Uh, their Olympic experience, Ian, was very short, but obviously their Olympic impact is much more enduring. 
Nice story. Um, and listen, well, I want to talk to you about something else. Just a short time ago, another huge Canadian win, the women's eight rowing team, a stunning gold. Uh, tell us about that. Okay, so this is, this is extraordinary. This is the first time Canada's women's eight have won uh, a medal, uh, a gold medal since Barcelona. We're talking 29 years ago. We all know the chef de mission, Marnie McBean, is a rower. She is losing her mind right now with excitement. This team, uh, when they started rowing, they led from the moment uh, they started, from the moment. They led throughout the entire race. This is a really important thing for them. We're just fresh off another medal for uh, the, the pairs uh, yesterday in, in rowing, another bronze. And I have to say, I had some time before the games to speak with Madison Maley, who right now has that gold medal around her neck. The way this team trained, Ian, was extraordinary. They focused so acutely on what the heat would take out of them. So their heat training was really meticulous. They took thermometer pills. They were measuring their core temperature as they went, trying to get them up, up to the peak, packing them constantly with ice vests before they get in the boat, ice socks. Uh, they were ready for the extreme temperatures. They're not even as bad today as they have been normally here. So th this team was incredibly strong and boy, did they ever earn this. It is an agonizingly tough race, and the women now have gold. Thanks, Adrian. You bet. Wildfires this summer have meant hundreds of smoke warnings across the country. We have particular concern about infants who are exposed in utero. Up next, the hidden impact on the health of Canadians.
contests. They're back <laughs> for a new season. Awesome, I can't wait. With a new dragon. Gonna hang out with the cool kids. This free app brings you the news you want, local and international. Easy to use and easy to set the way you like. Get the free CBC News app. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, Rodrigo Duterte has been called the vigilante president for his handling of the drug trade in the Philippines. What will the end of his term mean for the country's future? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. As hundreds of wildfires consume forests in parts of Canada, a danger to people extends far beyond the fire zones. You may have been bothered by smoke, but may not realize the threat it poses, especially to newborn babies and even those not yet born. With the incidence of those fires expected to increase, Tashana Reed looks into the long-term impact on our health. Blankets of smoke, a hazy skyline. This has been the scene in Thunder Bay on and off for weeks. On smoky days for Gail Hebert Miller, just being outside is a health risk. You're constantly with an inhaler, no matter where you are, you've got them everywhere. I have them at home, at camp, at work, in my vehicles. But it, it's just so hard to breathe. Smoke triggers her asthma. It's why she wears her mask even to walk a short distance. As soon as I open that door, I can smell the smoke. I, I don't go out. It's like we stay indoors. Wildfire season means few daily walks with her dogs, keeping the windows and doors closed at all times and constantly monitoring the air quality. Her puffers and asthma medications run her nearly $1,000 a month, but she can't do without them. It's very hard to catch your breath. It's like somebody's sitting on your chest all the time. Ongoing wildfires in northern Ontario have prompted poor air quality alerts across the province. On this day in Thunder Bay, the air quality is at a moderate risk, but if the wind changes direction, who knows? Respirologist Dr. Barubi Beeman runs a weekly asthma clinic in the city. We are seeing more of the severe asthmatics right now. Um, a lot of them, many of them in fact, are not well controlled. Most of her patients have had to increase their medications and stay home. Dr. Beeman is concerned about what lies ahead. It's anticipated it's going to get worse. And if it does, we're going to see increasing health care costs, increasing cost of the impact on the community, ability to work, ability to provide services. And I think this is all, uh, you know, sort of a perfect storm right now. Across Canada, wildfires this season have displaced thousands of people, decimated whole communities, and impacted air quality from coast to coast. While being outside has been a safe place during this pandemic, on days when air quality is poor, Health Canada recommends limiting outdoor activity, keeping windows and doors closed, and if possible, using an air filter at home. Wildfire smoke is a mix of gases and tiny particles produced when organic materials burn, and the long-term health effects of exposure are mostly unknown. Those very small particles can reach deep into your lungs and they can cause irritation and inflammation. Sarah Henderson, a scientific director of environmental health for the BC Centre for Disease Control, is trying to find answers. They are a foreign invader the same way that a bacterium or a virus would be a foreign invader. And your body treats them the same way, but it can't kill them because they're not alive. Henderson has two long-term studies underway one that examines infants exposed to smoke during BC's 2017 and 2018 wildfire seasons, and another that examines the impact in people with underlying health conditions, such as heart or lung disease. We have particular concern about infants who are exposed in utero and infants who are exposed very early in their lives. There's the potential for these big and significant wildfire smoke exposures to affect the health of those individuals throughout their lives. There's also the impact on health systems. A recent study looking at Yellowknife's 2014 wildfire season showed just how big of an impact. 
we had increased uh, presentations for pneumonia. We had about double the emergency department visits for asthma over the course of our two and a half month smoke exposures. Emergency physician Dr. Courtney Howard says she's most concerned about how climate change will continue to exacerbate the issue of wildfires. Continued warming already has impacts and is going to continue to warm through to at least mid-century. So we have to move this reality of, of warming into our common vision of the future so we can make the best plans to prepare. Only halfway through the wildfire season, hundreds of fires are currently burning across Canada. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, we take a look at Fiji's rugby victories in the Olympics as the women take Canada and the men win gold. As you can see, the nation can hardly contain its excitement. And tonight, that's our moment. Girls go missing, girls end up dead. There was so much discrimination towards trans people, so we lived in the shadows. The law is not helping whatsoever. The Village, Season 2. Available now on the CBC Listen app and everywhere you get your podcasts. This free app brings you the news you want, local and international. 
easy to use and easy to set the way you like. Get the free CBC News app today. Canada's women's rugby sevens fell to Fiji yesterday. It was a heartbreaker for Canada, but it's worth a moment to stop and think about Fiji. The tiny Pacific nation is having a pretty good Olympics. The men's rugby sevens won gold. That is their second in a row for the sport, and no one on that team nor in that country is taking it for granted. Tonight, their gratitude is our moment. This is Fiji's men's rugby team, probably breaking the rules, but probably unable to contain themselves, belting out the national anthem after winning gold in Tokyo. The anthem is called, We Have Overcome. They knew those back home were soaking in every second. Strike. The exhausted Ministry of Health workers needed the joy. So did everyone else. In an Olympic year when celebrations have felt so quiet and so intimate, this was a standout moment. And so is that Fijian rugby team. Fiji has only ever won two Olympic medals, both gold, both in rugby. The first time in Rio in 2016, Tokyo made it two. The path to Tokyo 2020 was so hard, flights difficult to find, they ended up arriving on a cargo flight full of frozen fish. And the country they left behind is really struggling with COVID. The players said they just wanted to lift people's spirits. And a sense of how badly the country is struggling in terms of COVID, there are 900,000 people in Fiji, 25,000 confirmed COVID cases there. Last time around, after the win in Rio, the country issued a $7 commemorative coin for the Rugby Seven. so we're wondering if this time it'll be another $7 coin or maybe for two wins in a row, a 14. That is The National for July 29th. Good night.